Okay, so hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're gonna to finish up our chapter 13 lecture on fluids. And where we left off last time was an introduction to fluid mechanics. So now, instead of just considering static fluids, which are not moving, we're going to develop some equations that describe moving fluids, fluids that are in motion, fluids that are flowing. So the first equation we're gonna develop is the equation of continuity. And so let's get into that. Okay, so in order to understand the equation of continuity, it's gonna be useful to visualize how a fluid is moving. So that's where streamlines come in. So a streamline shows you the trajectory that particles take as a fluid flows. So this is a diagram showing us a bunch of streamlines in a flowing fluid. This is what they represent. Uh, so if I have a particle of fluid that starts over here, the streamline is indicating the path that that particle is going to take. It's just going to go along the streamline like this. If I have some fluid that starts off over here, then this streamline is telling me that this is the path it would take. Okay, so it's just indicating the trajectory or the path of particles in our fluid, which is useful for visualizing the motion that's happening. Now, a few things to note. One, the velocities of particles are always tangent to the streamlines. So if I have a particle of fluid right here, it's moving straight to the right. If I have a particle of fluid, let's say over here somewhere, it's moving to the right, but also a little bit downwards. The velocity is always tangent to that streamline. So, if we're dealing with a laminar flow, then the streamlines that you see on a diagram are always going to be organized in parallel layers. So one streamline is going to be parallel to the one immediately next to it, is parallel to the one immediately next to that. It's organized in these parallel layers. That's a laminar flow. A turbulent flow, on the other hand, the streamlines would look a lot more complicated. But again, in this class, we're always going to be dealing with a laminar flow. Okay, so next we're going to define a quantity called the volumetric flow rate. And here is what the volumetric flow rate represents. The volumetric flow rate, given by capital R, is how we'll see it in our equations, is the volume of fluid passing through a cross-section of the fluid per unit time. So we can think of it as a volume over a time or in differential form, dv dt, the volume passing through per unit time. But to really get the specifics right, here's the picture you should have in your head. So we have some kind of flowing fluid, and these are a bunch of streamlines in that fluid. Okay, this is what we call a bundle of streamlines when we consider uh, a group of them. So we can define a cross-sectional surface that would be perpendicular to those streamlines at any point along the bundle. So for, for instance, if these are our streamlines, this would be a cross-section, uh, a cross-sectional area that's perpendicular to the streamlines. And this would be another cross-sectional area over here that's perpendicular to those streamlines. Now, here's the thing about this bundle of streamlines that we've indicated here. The volumetric flow rate is actually constant along that bundle of streamlines, meaning it doesn't matter if we pick this cross section over here or this cross section over here, the volume of fluid passing through the cross section per unit time is the same. It's constant along those streamlines. And the reason for that is, well, if we're going from this point to this point in our fluid, we actually don't have any fluid coming in from the outside, right? There's no streamline coming in from the outside into our bundle or fluid exiting that bundle, right? Any fluid that moves through this surface is also going to move through this surface. So the volumetric flow rate for those two surfaces is actually the same. Okay, so let's do an example. We have a hollow cone that has a radius of 15 centimeters and a height of 45 centimeters. Now we place this under a water faucet. The faucet is turned on 
and the water flows out at a constant rate, R, is equal to 9.5 centimeters cubed per second. So that's the volume per unit time coming out of the faucet. How long does it take to fill up the entire cone with water? And so we'll give the answer in units of minutes. All right, so let's work it out. Okay, so we'll start with the definition of volumetric flow rate. R is equal to dV over dt. We can rearrange this to say that dV is equal to R times dt. And the next thing we can do with this is just integrate both sides. So here's the thing about R. It's going to be a constant. So the rate at which water is coming out of the tap and into the cone is a constant. So we can pull that out of the integral. So on the right side, I'll pull out the R, and then we just have the integral of dt. Let's also put some limits on this. So for the time, we'll start at zero. And at that time, when we begin filling up the cone, there's no volume in it. So the lower limit on the volume side of the equation is also zero. And then this will go to some time t. And over here, we'll go to some final volume, which I'll just call v, okay? Well, dv just integrates to v. So we have v evaluated from zero to v over here. On the other side, we have r and then dt. That just integrates to t which we evaluate from zero to t. So on the left side, I have v minus zero. On the right side, I have r times t minus zero, which is just another way of saying that the volume in the cone is equal to the flow rate r times the time t. Okay, so just equal to rate times time. Now, I wanna know what the time is. So t, is equal to V over R. So for the volume, I have to remember that I'm dealing with a cone and the formula for the volume of a cone is one third pi R squared times H. So this is the volume of a cone. Of course, the cone is eventually gonna be entirely filled with water. So this is the volume that we wanna use. So I have one third times pi, lowercase r squared, that represents the radius of the cone times h, over uppercase r, which represents the flow rate, okay? So here's what we have, one third pi, lowercase r is 15 centimeters, and we square it, that's the radius of the cone, h is the height of the cone, 45 centimeters, and then big R on the bottom is the flow rate of 9.5 centimeters cubed per second. So here's what we're going to get in that calculation. 1,116. We're going to keep two sig figs. And the units are our seconds because centimeters cubed cancel out. Now, we'll convert that to minutes. So remember... In every minute, we have 60 seconds. So one minute in our conversion factor is on top, and 60 seconds is on the bottom. Okay, so seconds cancel, and then we're left with minutes. So 1,116 over 60 is about 18.6. Now we're keeping two sig figs, so about 19 minutes. That's how long it would take to fill up the cone. Now keep in mind, this is a very large cone and the flow rate is pretty slow, which is why this is gonna take so long. Okay, but this is how we calculate it. Okay, so here's a follow-up question for you guys. We have a hollow cone placed under a faucet. The faucet is turned on and the water flows out at a constant rate, just like before. So let's let y of t denote the water level in the cone as a function of time. So here's the y-axis, right? y equals zero is the very bottom of the cone, so that's where the water starts off. But then over time, the water line goes up as the cone accumulates more and more water. 
So at any given time, y of t tells us uh, the height of that water line, okay? So what I want to know is what is y of t proportional to? So does y of t go as time to the third power? Is it time squared? Is it just proportional to time? Is it time to the one half power or time to the one third power? So think about this for a second. See if you can maybe intuitively get the answer. And then we'll go through it together in all the mathematical rigor. But again, first pause the video, see if you can get it, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so to start, let's just clarify what's being asked here. Let's say we plot the height of the water in the cone on this axis. Okay, and then on the horizontal axis, we'll just plot the time. So the first answer choice says the height is proportional to t cubed. So that would be a curve that looks like this. This would be t cubed. Okay, t squared, well, that's just a parabola but it's a less steep curve than t cubed, so that's, that's the t squared one. Now, if the height is just proportional to t, then that's a straight line. If it's proportional to t to the one half, well, that would be like the square root of t. So this is the curve we would get. It's a curve that grows slower than the straight line curve. And then t to the one third would be like this. That would be the slowest growing one out of all of these. Okay, so we're basically just trying to figure out what type of curve are we dealing with in this situation. So let's draw a picture of the cone. So here is the full cone. Let me try that again. Here's the, the uh, entire cone right here. And let's take note of the fact that it has a certain radius. So here, if I draw a little line that goes right through the center of the cone like this, the distance uh, from that line to the edge is capital R. So capital R is the radius of the cone for us. The height of the cone from the vertex down here is H. And so next, Let's show where the water is in the cone at a certain time. So let's say this is our water line right here, okay? What I'm going to do is show an infinitesimal volume element of fluid. Okay, so this is going to be our volume element. And what this represents is a volume dV, which is added to the cone in a tiny infinitesimal time, which we'll call dt. Okay, so this is the volume that's added to the cone in time dt. All right, so a few things about this volume element that I just drew. It has a certain height as well, but it's not the total height of the cone. So we'll call this y, okay? It also has a thickness to it, which I'll call dy. And then it also has a radius, which I'll call lowercase r, okay? So the first thing we'll write down is what is that added volume? What is that dV? Well, dV is a really thin disk. The shape of it, as you can see here, is like a cylinder where the cross-sectional area is pi r squared, lowercase r, right? And then the thickness is dy, so this would give us the volume, right? Pi r squared times dy. Okay, so here's what we're going to do next. I'm going to notice that I have a little angle theta right there. Uh, that's like the opening angle of my cone. And so from that, I'll notice that I have two similar triangles. Let me just draw them for you. 
So I have a larger triangle, which is made from the entire cone, where I have the angle theta here. I have the actual radius of the cone itself, capital R here, and the height of the cone, H right here, and then a right angle right there. Now the smaller triangle only goes up a height Y, so we're only going up to where the water is. This radius is lowercase r. This is a right angle, but it's the same angle theta that we denoted earlier. Okay, so here's what we can do. We can compare the two triangles using the tangent function. Tangent theta, of course, is the opposite side over the adjacent. So in the first triangle, that's big R over H. In the second triangle, that's little r over y. So this tells us that little r is equal to big R over h times y. And big R over h right here is just a constant. So this is telling us that the little radius is growing as y gets bigger. So as we add more and more water, and the water level goes up, this little r radius also increases. So let's actually then put that in our dv expression. dv, remember, is pi r squared dy. Well, instead of r, I'm going to replace that with big R over h times y, as we just worked out. Square that times dy. So what do we have? We have pi big R squared over H squared times Y squared times DY. So that's our little volume that we add in time DT. But here's the thing, the flow rate, that's by definition DV over DT. In other words, that's pi times r squared over h squared times y squared dy over dt. All right, that's our flow rate right there. Okay, so let's take that equation and rearrange it just a little bit. What I basically wanna do is put all the y terms on one side of the equation, okay? So I have y squared, times dy, that would equal, on the other side I have dv dt, that's the flow rate. Next thing I'm gonna do is multiply by h squared, divide pi big R squared, and then multiply by dt. Okay, so that looks kind of intimidating, but let me just put a parenthesis around this part dv dt, that's the flow rate, h, that's the height of the cone, and then capital R is the radius of the cone. All of this stuff is constant. Okay? So, let's just call that big constant there, let's just call it k, okay? Let's just absorb all of that into a single constant, which we call k. So I have y squared dy, equals k times dt, okay? So just a single constant, like so. Okay, so we're almost there. Last thing I'm gonna do is integrate that equation on both sides, okay? So on the left side, I have integral of y squared dy. On the other side, I have a constant k, which I can just pull out, times the integral dt. Let's put the limits on. For the initial time, I'm gonna use t equals zero. And at that time, when the water starts flowing, the height in the cone is also zero. So on the left side, my lower limit is also zero. My upper limit for time is t, and then my upper limit for y is, I'll call it y at time t. So y at time t is my upper limit. Okay, so, I have y squared that I'm integrating on 
the left side. That's just a third times i cubed. Okay, and then I evaluate from zero to y squared, or sorry, uh, I evaluate from zero to y at time t. On the other side, I just have dt, which integrates to t. So I have k, this integrates to t, and then we go from zero to t when we evaluate that. Okay, so I have one-third, plug in the limit, uh, y at time t, that's cubed, plug in the bottom limit, that's zero. On the other side, I have k times t, and then just minus zero when I plug in the bottom limit. All right, so if I want to solve for y as a function of time, well, first I'll multiply through by three, so I have three times kt, but I have to take the cubed root or take this to the one-third power to undo the power of three on the left side, okay? So here's the takeaway. Y as a function of time is just some constant times t to the one-third power, which means this is proportional to t to the one-third power. This is the, the correct answer. So if we go back to our original drawing, the height in the cone um, is growing very slowly, okay? Uh, because as the water line goes up, the radius increases. So um, it's going to actually fill up in height more and more slowly as time goes on. So that's the t to the one-third power that you see here. Okay, so now that we've practiced using this idea of volumetric flow rate, we're ready to derive the equation of continuity. So let's take this picture that I showed you before, where we have a bunch of different streamlines, a group of them, which we call a bundle of streamlines. And we'll have a cross-sectional area over here on the left side that these streamlines are going through. And then we'll have another one on the right side that these streamlines are going through. And basically what you see here is the second area is bigger because the streamlines have spread out um, as they move from the left to the right. So we're going to let V1 indicate the speed of the fluid uh, on the left side uh, through this surface over here. And we're going to let V2 indicate the speed of the fluid at this surface over here. Okay, so that's the setup. Now, the volumetric flow rate is constant along the bundle. So again, it's the same volume per unit time going through this surface as it is going through this surface. So we can say R1 is equal to R2. The flow rates are the same here and here. Now, a flow rate is just dV dt, volume per unit time. So what we have is dV1 dt is equal to dV2 dt. The volume per unit time is the same. Okay, well, let's take a closer look at that volume. So dV represents a tiny little bit of volume moving through our surface. So the surface has an area A, and the distance that the fluid moves through it is what we'll call dx, all right? So that means dv, that little bit of volume that's moved through, is just a times dx. It's the area times the thickness uh, going through that surface. Okay, so if dv is a times dx, we can put that into our equation where I have a1 dx1 over dt on the left side over here and then I have a2 dx2 over dt over here. So the next thing to realize is that the speed of the fluid, the speed that the fluid is moving with, is dx dt, right? It's the distance dx that it moves through uh, in a unit of time dt. So dx dt is the speed. So I can make this even simpler by saying, on the left side, I have a1 times v1, and that equals a2 times v2. That's the equation of continuity, is that a times v is the same 
along a bundle of streamlines. So now that we've derived the equation of continuity, here are some of the takeaway points. So first, the volumetric flow rate can be written in the following way. R is equal to A times V, where A is the cross-sectional area of that bundle of streamlines, and V is the flow speed. Now, because R is constant along any bundle of streamlines, then A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2 for any two locations within that bundle. So one and two are just arbitrary labels we give to any two locations within that bundle of streamlines. And so here's the third point. If streamlines become more tightly packed, then the fluid is gonna flow faster. So here's an example. Let's say we have a pipe and the pipe is wide over here, but then it becomes more narrow as the fluid flows through it to the right side. So the cross-sectional area of the pipe, in other words, is greater over here, let's call this point one, than it is over here. Let's call this point two. So A1 is bigger than A2, right? Well, if A1 times V1 is equal to A2 times V2, so the product of A and V is constant, then if the area is decreasing over here, then the speed must be increasing in order to compensate for that because the product of A times V has to stay the same. If the area is decreasing, then the speed is increasing. Okay, so the fluid is moving faster over here where the pipe is narrower than it is over here where the pipe is wider. Okay, so an analogy I like to give for this is traffic. So imagine we have a highway with a bunch of lanes open and a bunch of cars driving in each lane. Now, at some point, we close down some of the lanes of traffic. So let's say maybe we have five lanes of traffic open here and then just like three over here. Usually that's gonna cause a traffic jam or at least it will cause everyone to slow down, but we could actually keep the flow of traffic the same if everyone just agreed to drive faster, right? So if everyone speeds up, then we can actually keep the flow of traffic going even though the lanes of traffic uh, have narrowed down from five to three. So that's pretty much what's going on here in the pipe, right? Is we narrow the cross-sectional area and we increase the speed that has to happen if the flow rate is staying the same. Okay, so here's an example where we can use the equation of continuity to understand what's going on. So if you've ever noticed what happens when you turn on a water faucet, you don't turn it on too high because if the water's coming out too fast, you get this sort of turbulent flow. If you turn on the faucet just a little bit so that there's a laminar flow of water coming out of the pipe, you may have noticed that the stream of water gets narrower as the water moves downwards. So the stream is widest up here, and then it just gets narrower and narrower as the stream goes down. Well, we can actually understand why that is using the equation of continuity. So let's call this point in the stream of water point one, and then this point, which is a little below that, we'll call that point two. So the first thing to note is that at point two, the water has fallen a greater distance, so it's moving faster. Okay, so V2 is greater than V1, because gravity has had more time to accelerate the water once it's reached uh, this point down here. But the product of A1 and V1 has to be the same as A2 times V2. So if you think about it, if V1 is less than V2, that means A1 is greater than A2 in order for the product to remain the same. So in other words, the stream of water is wider, it has a bigger cross-sectional area up here at point one compared to down here at point two. That is to say, water that's fallen a greater distance has a greater speed and therefore it has a smaller cross-sectional area. And what we see is that the stream just gets narrower as it falls out of the faucet. So let's take a look at an example where we actually make some calculations then. Water flows through a section of pipe 
that has a circular cross-section with a radius r1 is equal to 4.5 centimeters. At that point over here, the speed of the water is 12 centimeters per second. The pipe then narrows to a radius over here of r2 is equal to 1.3 centimeters. So the question is, what is the speed of the water in that narrow section of the pipe? What is v2 over here? We'll calculate that in units of centimeters per second. And then as a follow-up, what is the volumetric flow rate of the water moving through the pipe in units of centimeters cubed per second? So pause the video, try to work this out, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we'll start with the equation of continuity, which says A1 V1 equals A2 V2 for any two points in that pipe. Now, we want to solve for V2. So V2 is A1 over A2 times V1. Now, the pipe has a circular cross-section. which means the area is pi times r squared. So a1 is pi times r1 squared, a2 is pi times r2 squared, and we're multiplying that ratio of the areas times v1 if we want to calculate v2. So the pi factors cancel, and this is just r1 over r2 squared. So we square the ratio of the areas, or sorry, we square the ratio of the radii to get the ratio of the areas. That's what we have here. And then we multiply that by V1, okay? So putting the numbers in, R1 is 4.5 centimeters, R2, 1.3 centimeters. Uh, we're gonna square that whole thing. And then we're gonna multiply by V1, which is 12 centimeters per second. So units of centimeters cancel here we're just left with centimeters per second. So this, uh, this turns out to be 143.8 centimeters per second. We wanna keep three sig figs on that. So it's 144 rounding to three sig figs centimeters per second. Okay, so that's the speed at the narrow portion of the pipe. So the speed is increased. Now the volumetric flow rate Okay, uh, oops, forgot how to spell. Uh, volumetric flow rate. Um, so we'll use uppercase R for that. Of course, that's the volume per unit time passing through the pipe, but we found there's a way to express this, which is just A times V, of course. Now, the flow rate is constant throughout the pipe. So that means we can pick either point. So in other words, I could do A1 times V1, or I could do A2 times V2. It doesn't matter. I'm going to get the same answer. So how about we do, uh, let's just do point one. How about, so the area would be pi times R1 squared and the speed would be v1, okay? So here I have pi times the radius is 4.5 centimeters, squaring that, and then we're multiplying by the speed at point one, which is 12 centimeters per second. So units are centimeters cubed per second. And if you calculate this, you get 763.4, which we round to 763 centimeters cubed per second. And again, you'd get the same answer if you did um, pi r2 squared times v2, right? You get the same result. Okay, so we've seen the equation of continuity. Next, we're gonna develop Bernoulli's equation. Now these two equations together, that's again, the equation of continuity and 
Bernoulli's equation um, form a complete description of how an ideal fluid moves. Okay, so we just need this one remaining equation to get the full picture. So here's how we're gonna derive Bernoulli's equation. We're going to apply energy concepts to an ideal fluid that's moving through a pipe, okay? So the pipe uh, is shown here. We have some fluid moving through it. Now, the area of the pipe at this point, which is point one, is gonna be A1. The height of the pipe at this point relative to the dashed line that you see here is gonna be Y1. And the speed that the fluid is moving with at this point is gonna be V1. Okay, now over here at this other end, uh, the pipe has an area A2, the height is Y2, and the fluid is moving through it with speed V2. Okay, that's the basic setup. So our system is just the shaded region shown here. Okay, everything between points one and two is our system. Now, of course, there's other fluid over here and over here, but the system that we're going to study is just the shaded region shown here. Okay, so the equation we're going to apply is delta K, change in kinetic energy, plus delta U is equal to the work done by outside forces. Okay, so what are those outside forces? Well, at the left end of the pipe over here, there's some fluid just to the left of our system, which is going to be pushing on it with a force, which we'll call F1. On the right side, there's going to be some fluid just to the right of our system pushing on it this way with a force that we'll call F2. So those will be the external forces doing work in this equation here. Okay, so here's the next step in our derivation. We're going to look at how the system changes from one moment in time to the next. So let's say initially this is what our system looks like. The system we're considering, again, is just this shaded region of fluid here. A small time later, let's say a small time dt after that, this entire uh, section of fluid has moved over. Okay, so we see that it's moved over now. Now on the left side, it's moved over a distance, which we'll call delta x1. And on the right side, it's moved over a distance, which we'll call delta x2. So we can actually calculate the work done by the external forces because if we take a look at the left side, we have force F1 pushing to the right and the fluid is moving a distance delta x1 to the right. So the work would be F1 times delta x1. On the left side, uh, the fluid over here is pushing to the left on our system with a force F2 but we're moving to the right, so those are in opposite directions. The work is negative. W2 is negative F2 times delta X2. Okay, so that's the work done by these two outside forces on our system. So another thing to notice here is that on the bottom of the pipe here, we initially had a little bit of mass, which is now gone because the system has moved over to the right. And on the right end of the pipe, we have some extra mass that wasn't there before because again, the system has moved over to the right. So let's call that bit of mass uh, delta M, okay? An equal amount of mass delta M moves from the left end over here to the right end over here effectively, okay? Okay, so the big picture again is we have delta K plus delta U is equal to W external. So W external is the work done by outside forces acting on our system. Remember we have W1 and W2 to consider here. So that would be F1 times delta X1 minus F2 times delta X2 as we saw previously. So remember we have a mass element delta M which moves from the left end where the height is Y1 and the speed is V1, to the right end, where the height is Y2, and the speed is V2. Other than that, nothing else has really changed. So, 
the change in kinetic energy would be one half delta m times v2 squared minus one half times delta m times v1 squared. That's the overall change in kinetic energy of our fluid um, in that small moment in time that I showed you earlier. And by the same token, the change in potential energy, remember potential energy is given by mg times y. So we'd have delta m for our mass times g, and the change in height is y2 minus y1. So what we've done here is we've taken all the terms in this energy equation and we found expressions for them. So we have the work external, we have the change in kinetic energy, and the change in potential energy. So the next thing to do is just put that all together, plug those expressions in to the energy equation. So again, for delta K, change in kinetic, we have one half delta M times V2 squared minus one half times delta M times V1 squared. For delta U, we have delta M times G times Y2 minus Y1. And for the work external, we have F1 times delta X1 minus F2 times delta X2. All right? So if we take a look at the two force terms, we can remember that force is equal to pressure times area. So where we see F1 and where we see F2, we can actually replace those with pressure times area. So everything on the left side is the same as before. But again, on the right side, now we have P1 times A1, pressure times area, times delta X1, minus P2 times A2 times delta X2. And if we take a closer look at what we have on the right side, we basically have an area times a small distance, A times delta X. Well. If we kind of look at that geometrically, A is the cross-sectional area of the pipe. And then delta X is that small distance our fluid has moved through the pipe. So if I take that cross-sectional area and I multiply by that small distance delta X, what I get is a volume, because the volume is the area times that width. So where I see A times delta X, I can replace that with delta V, a small volume, okay? That's what that is. So let's do that substitution. Again, everything on the left is the same. On the right, now what I have is P1 times delta V minus P2 times delta V. And by the way, this delta V is the same for one and two because the same volume that leaves the left end of the pipe is entering the right end. Okay, so let's take that and let's make some more manipulations to that equation. The first thing you should note is that we have mass over here and volume over here. So mass over volume is density. It looks like we can sort of turn this into something involving density if we just divide through by delta V, divide through by this little volume here, okay? So, Okay, on the left side now, I have a half times delta M over delta V times V2 squared minus a half times delta M over delta V times V1 squared plus delta M over delta V times G times Y2 minus Y1. And then we got rid of the delta V here because we divided through. So we just have P1 minus P2 on that side. So the next thing to notice is that, of course, that delta M over delta V thing we have floating around everywhere is just the density. It's the mass per unit volume. So we'll make that substitution. So I'll have a half times rho, that's the density, V2 squared minus a half times rho times V1 squared plus rho times G, Y2 minus Y1 equals P1 minus P2. That's the equation as it currently stands. So the last thing we do to get the final result is simply to rearrange the terms, okay? Put everything with a subscript one on the left side, put everything 
uh, with the subscript two on the right side. And here's what you'll get. P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus rho times G times Y1 equals the same thing with subscript two. So we have P2 plus a half times rho times V2 squared plus rho times G times Y2. That's Bernoulli's equation. That's what it is. So Bernoulli's equation for an ideal fluid. This relates the pressure, which is P, the flow speed, which is V, how fast the fluid is moving, as well as the height, which is Y, at any two locations within the ideal fluid. So one and two are just arbitrary labels for any two locations within the fluid. We can compare any two points that we like. So another way of stating this is that this quantity, okay, pressure plus a half times density times the speed squared plus the density times G times Y, that whole thing is a constant. It stays constant throughout the fluid. And essentially, this is a conservation of energy equation applied to a fluid. The fundamental starting point of this was conservation of energy. So this is just what that looks like when we apply it to a fluid. We get Bernoulli's equation. So most of the time, we'll be writing it in this form because we'll be comparing two points in a fluid and uh, relating their properties. But this is the meaning behind Bernoulli's equation. Okay, with that said, let's do an example where we actually get to put it to use. So here we have a tower that has a height YA equals 32 meters. So here is the height of the tower YA, 32 meters. The diameter, capital D, is three meters. This water tower supplies water to a house uh, where the height of the actual tap um, that the water is going to come out of in the house is YC, 7.2 meters. Okay, we also have this horizontal pipe at the base of the tower, and that has a diameter of 2.54 centimeters. Okay, so that's lowercase d. The pipe in the house over here has a diameter d prime, which is 1.27 centimeters. So in order to satisfy the water needs of the house, the pipe delivers water at a rate, so this is our volumetric flow rate, of 0 0.00250 meters cubed per second. Okay, so a few questions here. What is the flow speed in units of meters per second uh, and the absolute pressure in units of atmospheres at point B. So we have, of course, some water flowing through the pipe here at point B. We want to know how fast it's moving and also what is the pressure at that point in the pipe. And then the same set of questions for point C. How fast is the water moving? What is the flow speed at that point? So we'll have to assume something in order to do this. We'll assume that this water tank here is open to the atmosphere. So that means this upper surface of the water here that's exposed to the air is just that atmospheric pressure. Okay, so with all that said, let's work it out. So we'll start this one by comparing points A and B in our fluid. And there are two equations we'll use. We have continuity, of course. Okay, this says that the flow rate, R, is equal to the area, the cross-sectional area, times the speed v. And this should be the same whether we're talking about point A or point B in our fluid. So area at point A times the flow speed at point A equals the area at point B times the flow speed at point B. Okay, that's how we compare points A and B with the equation of continuity. Now with Bernoulli's equation, this is what it looks like. So we have the pressure at point A 
plus a half times rho times VA squared plus rho times G times YA equaling the pressure at point B plus a half times rho times VB squared plus rho GYB. Okay, so let's take the continuity one and let's use it to solve for VB because of course part of this problem is to solve for the flow speed at point B. So VB is equal to R, the volumetric flow rate that we need, divided by the cross-sectional area of the pipe at point B. So what's the cross-sectional area? Well, it's a circular cross-section. So that would be pi times the radius squared. But let's be careful. We're not given the radius, we're given the diameter. And the radius is one half times the diameter. So at point B, the radi or sorry, the diameter is given by lowercase d. So we're taking a half of that and squaring it to get the area. Okay. So let's put the numbers in. We have a flow rate of 0 0.00250 meters cubed per second. And then we divide by the cross-sectional area of the pipe at point B, which is pi times a half. Now the diameter is 2.54 centimeters. In meters, that would be 0 0.0254 meters. And then we'd have to square that. Okay. So this would come out to 4.934, but we keep uh, three sig figs on that meters per second or 4.93 meters per second. So that's how fast the, um, the water is moving through the pipe at point B. Okay, so the next thing we'll do, if we want to know the, if we want to know the pressure at point B, is to apply Bernoulli's equation um, and then just solve for PB. So let's do that. Using Bernoulli's equation, as I wrote it down earlier, PB, the pressure at point B, well, that would be PA, and then I have a half times rho multiplying VA squared, but then minus VB squared. Okay, so moving this term to the other side means we subtract it. And then I have plus rho times G, and then I have YA but I'm subtracting this term to isolate PB on one side of the equation. So I'll have to do YA minus YB inside of there to get it right. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, I know the pressure at point A, that's atmospheric pressure. So that's good to go. I know the density, I know VB, I know the heights at point A and point B, so I know why. The only thing I don't know yet is VA, and I need to know that before I just crunch the numbers in this equation. So here's what we'll do. Going back to the equation of continuity now, if I solve for VA, VA is the cross-sectional area at point B divided by the cross-sectional area at point A times VA. Uh, sorry, times VB. What am I saying? Yeah. Okay. So what's the cross-sectional area at point B where, well, we just did this. It's, it's pi times a half of lowercase d squared. But point A is up at the top of the water tower. That's that gigantic diameter. So that would be pi times a half uppercase d and then square that. So what we have here is after canceling the, pack, the factors of pi and one half, um, lowercase d over uppercase d squared times VB, okay? So now let's put that into our equation. Um, so we have PB equals PA plus a half times rho 
Now, instead of VA, I'm going to replace that with what we just found, which is lowercase d over uppercase d squared times VB. And that whole thing gets squared. That's VA squared subbed out. Minus VB squared. And then plus rho G YA minus YB. All right. So to simplify that a little bit, it's PA plus a half times rho. Now there's a common factor of VB squared. We can pull that out. Now I have lowercase d over uppercase d to the fourth power because we square it twice and then minus one. And then I add to that rho g ya minus yb. All right, so here's the thing. Lowercase d, that's the diameter of the pipe um, on the ground, which is like 2.54 centimeters. Uppercase D is the diameter of the water tower, which is like three meters. So uppercase D is way, way bigger than lowercase D, which means if we take the ratio of lowercase D over uppercase D to the fourth power, that is a tiny number. So what we see in the brackets, which is lowercase D over uppercase D to the fourth power minus one, I mean, that's just basically minus one, because again, this is a tiny number right here. And you can calculate it and verify it's a very small number. So to a really good approximation, that thing in brackets is just minus one. So let's replace it with minus one, and here's what we get. We got PA plus a half, sorry, it's minus one, so now I have minus a half times rho times VB squared plus rho G Ya minus Yb. Okay, cool. Now we can calculate. Pressure at point A, it's atmospheric pressure, as we said before, which is, well, one atmosphere, or in Pascals, 1.013 times 10 to the 5 Pascals. Okay, then we have a half, uh, minus a half, that is, times rho. That's the density of water. That's 1 times 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter. And then we multiply by VB, which we found earlier, 4.934 meters per second, and we square that guy. Okay, then I have plus rho, that's the density once again, 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter. Multiplying G, that's 9.8 meters per second squared. And then finally, Ya minus Yb. Remember, Ya is the height of the tower. Uh, Yb is at ground level. We, we were told that Ya is 32 meters. And then Yb is zero. It's at ground level. That's the calculation we need to make, right? If you do that, you're going to get 4.027, 10 to the 5, Pascals, now we want to convert this to atmospheres. So here's what we'll do. In every one atmosphere, we have 1.013, uh, 10 to the five Pascals. Um, so this comes out to 3.976 atmospheres, keeping three sig figs about 3.98 atmospheres of pressure in the pipe at point B. So just a quick note on the units here. When we made the calculation, as I've suggested before, we converted everything to SI units. So it comes out in SI units when you do the calculation. All right, next part. We're going to compare points B and C. Okay, and again, we'll have a continuity equation, uh, which is the flow rate R is equal to the cross-sectional area at point B times the flow speed at point B. That equals 
cross-sectional area at point C times the flow speed at point C. Just to remind you, we have just one continuous pipe basically going from point A to point C. So the flow rate is staying the same along that entire pipe. And that's the equation of continuity for it. So let's solve for VC. That's one of the things we wanted to find here. So one way we can get this is to take cross-sectional area at point B divided by cross-sectional area at point C times VB. Okay. Remember, it's pi r squared for the area, where r is one half of the diameter. So at point A, the diameter is lowercase d. And at point C, the diameter is labeled as d prime. Okay. So that's the ratio of the areas multiplying VB. So what's that equal to? Well, canceling out the factors that we can cancel, we have d over d prime squared times vb, and now we can calculate that. So d is the diameter of the pipe um, at point b, which is 2.54 centimeters. d prime, that's the diameter of the pipe at point c, 1.27 centimeters. We're squaring that. VB, we found it earlier, 4.934 units are meters per second. Centimeters cancel here and here. So we get a flow speed for point C, which is in units of meters per second, working out to 19.74 meters per second. Keep three sig figs, 19.7 meters per second. So that's how fast the water is moving at point C in our diagram. Okay, the last thing to do is to get the water pressure at point C in the diagram. So here's what we have. Bernoulli. So again, we're comparing points B and C here. PB is equal, uh, sorry, PB plus a half times rho times VB squared plus rho times G times YB equals that same quantity, but for point C, so that's PC plus a half times rho times VC squared plus rho GYC. All right, I wanna solve for PC. So that's equal to PB plus a half times rho I've got VB squared there, but I'm going to subtract VC squared. And then I have rho G and then a YB next to that, but I'm going to subtract YC. This way, I'm solving for what I'm looking for. So the pressure at point B, we found that before. Remember, that was 4.027, 10 to the 5 pascals. So we add to that one half times rho, density of water, 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter. And then we have VB squared minus VC squared. VB is 4.934 meters per second, square that whole thing, minus VC, 1974 meters per second, square that whole thing right there. Then we have rho, once again, 1.00, 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter, multiplying G, 9.8 meters per second squared, and then uh, YB minus YC. So the height at point B is zero, the height at point C we're given to be 7.2 meters, like this. Okay, so that's a lot to calculate, but when you do it, it's 1.495, 10 to the five pascals, which we better convert to atmospheres as a final step. So one atmosphere is 1.013, 10 to the five pascals. That's the conversion between the two. 
Cancel out Pascals. We have atmospheres now. 1.475 atmospheres is the result. Or rounding it to the right number of sig figs, 1.48 atmospheres. So that was a lot of work, but we found the pressure and the flow speed both at point B and point C. Okay, and we used it by combining, we did this by combining Bernoulli's equation with the equation of continuity. Okay, so here's another example where we can use Bernoulli's equation to understand what's going on. And that is siphoning a fluid. So when we're siphoning fluid, the basic idea is we have a container over here filled with some fluid, and then we have a second container over here and our goal is to take the fluid from this container and move it over here. So the way we do that is with a siphon tube. So this is a tube that goes into the first container and then uh, fluid spills out from there into the second container. So how do we get this to work? Well, it's not going to just start flowing on its own. So if I just put the tube in here and then let this tube hang out, the fluid is not gonna start moving. I first have to prime the tube. I have to pull fluid out all the way through the tube until it starts flowing out of here. And then once I've done that, it will continue to flow out of the tube at a steady speed, which is given by this equation. So it's the square root of two times G times H, where H is the height difference between the end of the tube here and the surface of the fluid that we're siphoning from over here. Okay, so that's the distance h that you see in this equation. Another feature of the siphon is that if we make this tube go up too high, then it won't work anymore. The flow is gonna stop if we exceed a certain height. And so let's call the height of the tube, the maximum height that the tube gets to, again, relative to that same line, let's call that H prime. H prime has to be less than or equal to the pressure of the atmosphere divided by rho G, or else the flow is going to stop, okay? So let's derive these two results. Again, we're gonna do that using Bernoulli's equation. All right, so we'll start by comparing two points in the fluid. I'm gonna compare points A and D. So point A refers to the top surface of the fluid in the uh, container that we're siphoning from. And then point D refers to the fluid that's coming out of the siphon tube over here. So the first thing to note is that the pressure at point A and the pressure at point D are both just atmospheric pressure because they're both exposed to the air. Okay, so the pressure at points A and D is just the pressure of the air. Okay, so next, let's use the continuity equation uh, to compare these two points. We have the cross-sectional area of the container at point A times the speed of the flow at point A. So basically, uh, we're going to have uh, the fluid flowing down like this at point A. So VA is referring to that speed. And then that's equal to the cross-sectional area of the siphon tube at point D times the flow speed at point D. So let's take that and solve for VA. That's equal to the cross-sectional area at point D divided by cross-sectional area at point A times VD. Okay, next let's write down Bernoulli's equation. And this says um, when we compare points A and D that PA plus a half times rho times VA squared plus rho G YA is equal to 
pressure at point D plus a half times rho times VD squared plus rho G YD. All right, so the first thing we'll note is that PA and PD are the same thing. So we can actually cancel out the terms for PA and PD right there in the equation. The next thing we can do is sub in for VA what we wrote just a second ago. So I have one half times rho times cross-sectional area at point D divided by cross-sectional area at point A times VD. Square that whole thing. And then I have rho G times YA. That equals one half times rho times VD squared plus rho G YD. So now that the pressure terms are gone, we notice that every single term in this equation has a factor of rho, factor of the density, which can just be canceled out or divided out across the board. Okay, so next, let's shuffle things around. I have one half times VD squared in two of the terms in this equation. The first one is right here. So there's a factor of one in front of that. If I subtract this term, the other one, uh, from both sides, so pulling out the one-half VD squared part leaves us with minus AD over AA squared in the brackets right there. So on the other side of the equation, I'm going to have G times YA minus YD. So here, let's multiply through by 2, and that's what we'll have. So the next thing to notice is that the cross-sectional area of the container at point A is way, way bigger than the cross-sectional area of the siphon tube, right? So this is the area at point A, but this is a much smaller area for the siphon tube. So we're taking a very small number over a very big number right here and then squaring it, which gives us a really, really small number. So the thing in brackets that you see here is approximately just equal to 1 minus a really small number, so it's approximately just equal to 1. Okay, so therefore VD squared, the thing in brackets is just 1, is equal to 2 times G times YA minus YD. Well, what's the difference in height between point A and point D? This height and this height. Well, that's just H in our diagram. So VD, which is the speed at which the fluid is exiting the siphon, is the square root of 2GH. So that's where that came from. All right, next. Let's take the diagram and compare points C, oops, points C and D. All right? So here's what we know about these two points. The pressure at point D, that's the uh, fluid coming out of the siphon, is just atmospheric pressure. And the pressure at point C, well, we don't know what it is. It can be anything as far as we're concerned at this point. So let's write down um, the equation of continuity, okay? So that would be the cross-sectional area at point C times VC equals AD times VD. But here's the thing. These are just two different points within the tube, so the cross-sectional area at point C should be the same as at point D. Okay, so it's the same tube, in other words. So that immediately implies that VC is equal to VD. So the speed of the fluid at point C is the same as the speed of the fluid at point D. Okay, so the next thing we'll do is write down Bernoulli So we have PC plus one-half times rho times VC squared plus rho 
times G times YC equals PD plus one half rho VD squared plus rho G YD. Okay, so I just said a second ago that the speed at point C is the same as the speed at point D, which means I can cancel out these two terms that contain the speeds. The next thing I can do is I can solve for PC and move everything else to the other side of the equation. So PC would be the pressure at point D, which by the way is atmospheric pressure, PATM, plus rho times G times YD minus YC. So when it comes to this quantity, which is YD minus YC, we can go to the diagram. Point D is down here, point C is up here. So the height difference is H prime, but because point D is lower, when we do YD minus YC, we get something negative. So we should put in negative H prime for that height. So PC is equal to P atmosphere minus rho G H prime. And again, we don't exactly know what sort of value to assign to PC, but what we can say is that it doesn't go negative. Pressure can't be negative. Okay, we're talking about absolute pressure here. Okay, pressure of zero means you have a perfect vacuum, so you can't go lower than that. So we can say PC is less than or equal to, sorry, greater than or equal to zero, right? Meaning it can't go negative. Okay, so if this is our expression for PC, we're going to say that pressure of the atmosphere minus rho g h prime is greater than or equal to zero. It can't go negative. Therefore, pressure of the atmosphere is greater than or equal to rho g h prime, which means h prime, if we solve for it, is less than or equal to the pressure of the atmosphere divided by rho times g. So that was the second result, meaning you can only make the siphon tube go so high before it breaks the siphon and the fluid stops flowing. Okay, so this will work as long as you don't set H prime to anything bigger than this. Okay, so we'll do one more example. Here, we have water flowing through a pipe as shown in the diagram. At point A, right here, the diameter of the pipe is 9.85 centimeters. At point B, which is 3.75 meters below point A, the diameter of the pipe is 3.95 centimeters. Okay, some more information. At point A, the pressure of the water is 9.85 times 10 to the 5 pascals and it's flowing with a speed of 5.15 meters per second. Based on that, what is the pressure and the speed of the water at point B? Use 1.00 times 10 to the three kilograms per cubic meter when you need to use the density of water. So pause the video, try to work this out. You're gonna be using Bernoulli's equation and the equation of continuity together. See what you get, and then come back to the video. All right, so we'll start with um, the equation of continuity. And um, this says that the cross-sectional area of the pipe at point A times the flow speed at point A is equal to the cross-sectional area of the pipe at point B times the speed of the fluid at point B. So we'll solve for VB. That's going to be AA over AB. These are these two cross-sectional areas of the pipe times VA. The pipe is going to have a circular cross-section. Okay. In other words, this is the type of area we're talking about. And so 
pi times r squared or pi times one half of the diameter squared would give us the area. So here's the diameter at point A and then pi times one half the diameter at point B squared is that ratio of the areas, which is multiplying VA. So factors of a half and pi cancel. This is just the diameter at point A over the, di the diameter at point B squared times VA. Okay, so let's put some numbers in that. The diameter of the pipe at point A is 9.85 centimeters. At point B, it's 3.95 centimeters, and we'll square that. Multiplied by the speed at point A, which is 5.15 meters per second. Centimeters go away like this, and we have 32.02 .02 meters per second with three sig figs. So 32.0 meters per second is the speed we're looking for. So next, let's use Bernoulli. Um, so Bernoulli's equation when we compare points A and B is PA plus a half times rho times VA squared plus rho GYA equals PB plus a half times rho times VB squared plus rho GYB. Our goal here is to find the pressure at point B. So just move everything other than PB to the other side of the equation, giving us a half times rho VA squared minus VB squared. And then rho times g times ya minus yb. Okay. So the rest of this is just the plug and chug. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot plus pa. That's missing, right? So we need pa there. Okay. So pa is 9.85 10 to the 5 pascals. And then we have a half times rho, which is 1.00, 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter. That's the density of water. And then we have VA squared. That's 5.15 meters per second squared. Um, minus VB, which is 32.02 .02 meters per second. And we square that as well. Then we have rho, which is the same as before. Multiplying g, 9.8 meters per second squared. And then ya minus yb. So the pipe at point A is 3.75 meters above point B. So that's the height difference, 3.75. And this is the big calculation we need to do. But when you do it, you'll get 5.223 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And then keeping just uh, three sig figs on that, 5.22, 10 to the 5 pascals. Okay. So there it is. That's our pressure. So that's going to be it for this lecture. We've covered everything about fluids and fluid dynamics that I wanted to talk about. So we'll move on to a new chapter next time. I'll see you then. But until then, as always, be safe and be healthy out there. Take care.